Right. Welcome, everybody, once more. Uh, our new month, a new colloquium. I'm very, very pleased to have with us Professor Mike Sipser from MIT. You're the, um, the head of the, uh, the theory group in uh, the Applied Math Department or the Computer Science Department? Applied, applied Math. Applied Math Department, but uh, head of the Theory of Computer Science group there. And today he is going to fill us in with some of the details in the history about the P versus NP question, maybe the most well-known question in computer science theory. I'm going to pass this to you. I see you kind of clip in your pocket. And this is on your shirt. Thanks, Shai. So this is a cool place. Um, and I understand you guys are studying theory this month? Yes. Is that right? How's it going? Good. Was there another? Uh, oh, we're using your book. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, and was there another prerequisite course to this? Is there in like a discrete math or people coming in basically? This is the. There, there was a whole month in discrete math. About okay. Five months ago. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did some of this stuff in, yeah, in algorithms too. From the algorithm right. side of it, not from the complexity. Where in the um, com where in the course is the theory stuff? Is this a, just at the beginning of the course now? We're doing finite automata and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Chapter what? <laughs> Chapter one. Chapter one. Okay. Fine. Well, this is a little bit of uh, looking ahead. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk to you today about this thing called the P versus NP question. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a pretty famous problem. Uh, that came out of theoretical computer science and um, has, you know, percolated its way over into the mathematical community too. Um, I don't know if many of you know. Um, about a year ago, uh, there was a place called the Clay Institute, um, who was set up to fund various projects in mathematics, and they uh, announced a prize of a million bucks for the person who solves the P versus NP problem or uh, any of six other mathematical problems like the uh, Riemann's hypothesis or the Poincaré conjecture, whatever those are. I'm not going to talk about those today. Um, but anyway, this is, you know, it's a nice problem. It's uh, maybe the youngest of all of those problems. Um, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit about uh, where the problem came from, a bit about the significance and kinds of things that people have done to try to solve it, and um, a bunch of related matters too, um, sort of spreading out, touching on other topics in complexity theory, which is the uh, area um, connected to this problem. Okay. So first of all, what in the world is the P versus NP problem? I guess you've bumped into it in an algorithms course. You haven't seen it in the theory class yet. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, the P versus NP question asks, it concerns problems you want to solve on a computer. Um, certain kinds of problems you can solve really quickly. Other problems, even on a very fast computer, seem to take an incredibly long time. How come? Well, certain kinds of problems that seem to take a long time involve searching for the answer over a large number of possibilities. Let me give you an example. Suppose I take two big numbers, and I mean huge numbers, each of which has, say, 500 digits. So I'm not talking about a number which is like 500. I'm talking about a number which is 10 to the 500, some astronomically big number, more than the number of particles in the universe by a long shot. Um, and you take those two big numbers and you multiply them together to get an even bigger number, but now with a thousand digits. Now, even though those numbers are pretty big, the multiplication process is something that you can do pretty easily, at least with a personal computer. You could, there's a simple algorithm for multiplying the two numbers using just the same method that you learned in grade school, and that would give you the result in less than a second. But suppose you wanted to do the reverse process. 
namely start out with the thousand digit number and recover the two five hundred digit numbers that were multiplied together to give that thousand digit number. So I'm going to give you the answer and I want to know what was the problem in a sense. That's the so-called factoring problem, sort of the reverse of multiplication. Um, and that factoring problem is incidentally important for various cryptographic schemes, RSA, I don't know if you know anything about, you know, run into some of that stuff, but this is a, an important problem both from a theoretical point of view and also for certain very practical reasons, this factoring problem. The question is, you want to carry out, you want to implement the factoring problem on a computer so that the computer will actually do that factoring for you. Um, the bad news is that the only way, essentially, that people know how to factor numbers is to use trial division. Try dividing by two, by three, by five. At least you can confine yourself to the prime numbers, so that'll save you a little bit. But it's not going to save you enough to allow you to, to, to go through all the possibilities up through numbers with 500 digits. At least it's not going to sa save you enough to be able to do that within your lifetime or the lifetime of the universe. Because that's a huge number of possibilities that you would have to try in order to do this, solve that problem using brute, the brute force approach. Now maybe it's possible to factor numbers without resorting to that simple-minded brute force approach. Maybe you could just home in on the answer through some magical formula where you put in the thousand digit number, turn a little crank, do a little calculation, out comes the, 500, the two 500 digit numbers. Conceivably that could happen. And then you'd be able to factor numbers much more quickly without searching. Nobody knows whether you can do that or not. That's a very famous and very important unsolved mathematical problem which is closely related to the P versus MP question. Because what the P versus NP question really essentially asks is whether for any problem which can be solved by searching, is the brute force approach really necessary? Or can you always somehow avoid it? There are certain kinds of problems for which you can solve them with brute force, but you can also find solve them through a more direct way, much more quickly. Um, but what P versus NP asks is whether you can always do that, whether you can always shortcut your way through the brute force approach and find a solution which gives you, find an algorithm which gives you the solution more quickly. And this comes up in all sorts of different places. For example, you know, if you want to, if you say a university, not a big university, not this one, um, and you have lots of different classes and, and people taking final exams or whatever at different times, and you want to arrange a schedule where you're going to minimize the number of conflicts that the students are going to have. That's a very reasonable, practical problem that people are faced with and have to solve. Uh, sounds like a perfect one for the computer. You just feed in all the constraints, let the computer turn its crank somehow, and spit out the optimal schedule. Bad news. The only way that people know how to solve that problem is to brute force search your way through all possible schedules. If you really want to find the best answer, if you're going to be satisfied with something which is close to best, maybe you can do better. But if you want the best answer, no one knows how to do that within a reasonable amount of time. Nor does anybody know of a way to do that or to prove that you can't do better. So that's the question. Can you always beat brute force search, or is it sometimes really necessary? That's P versus NP, and it's related to problems in mathematics, problems in, in optimization, as the scheduling problem is, um, problems in computational biology. You want to find different ways that proteins fold up, and you want your uh, you know, amino acid sequences fold up, and you want to find the one that has the minimum energy, um, because that's presumably going to be the configuration that ends up occurring 
you know, inside the organism. Um, as it stands right now, people don't have very good methods for doing that, and one approach is the brute force approach. Um, uh, but there are so many different configurations to search through, that's still not very practical. And there's many, many, in physics, there's chemistry, there's many different areas of, in science and engineering and, and, and more broadly, where the question of brute force search, brute force search is a problem and you'd love to be able to get rid of it. But no one knows whether you can in general. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, uh, okay, first let me tell you a little bit why we uh, use this funny terminology P versus NP to refer to this question about brute force search. So P stands for polynomial time. And really what it means is the class of problems that you can solve quickly without searching. Because searching is going to involve an exponential number of possibilities. That's, I mean, the, the, that, that's in the cases of interest, anyway, that's uh, um, an exponential for us is a long time. So polynomial is something that's a modest amount of time, and P, the, the P class, is the class of problems that you can solve quickly. In contrast with the NP class, those are the problems that can be solved using searching. So you want to know, is the pro class of problems that can be solved using searching the same as the problems that can be solved quickly. So therefore, you would be able to always eliminate the searching by moving by through P being equal to NP, or perhaps P is different from NP, and there really are problems where the searching cannot be eliminated. So that's really the basic question of P versus NP. Is P equal to NP? Namely, you can always eliminate searching. Or is P different from NP? Some problems really need, search, need to be searched through. Um, by Murphy's law, P is probably not equal to NP. Because, you know, uh, it would just be too good to be true that you could always solve all of these problems quickly. Probably some of them need to, rec need to be searched, but no one knows how to prove that. And that's really what it comes down to is trying to find a way to prove that there's no clever way of solving certain problems. You need to search. Okay. Um, or maybe they're equal. So what I'd like to do n next is talk a little bit about the history of this problem because um, up until about 10 years ago, people generally traced the roots of this area to the 1960s. Both in the West and also in the Soviet Union, there were kind of two parallel developments where people were starting to look at the number of steps you need to solve various problems computationally. And the issue of brute force search sort of arose as an early consideration. Um, but remarkably, about 10 years ago, there was a letter discovered from the, from the 1950s, from 1956 to be exact, where this exact question was raised. And the letter itself is a kind of remarkable letter. It's a letter from uh, Gödel, Kurt Gödel, who was a famous mathematical logician, to John von Neumann, who was, uh, you know, w one of the, you know, also a mathematician and, and played a, played a key role in early computers. And so uh, Gödel wrote this letter to uh, von Neumann. Essentially, among other things, talking about this P, we didn't call it P versus NP, he talked about the question of being able to eliminate brute force search. I have that letter here. It's going to be, let's take a look at it because I think it's so cool. Bad news is the letter's in German. Uh, but I'll translate, let me see if we can focus a little bit better here. Do you know anything about the story about how the letter was found? Or? I don't know. That, I don't think that's terribly interesting. Somebody was, uh, searching through von Neumann's <coughs> archives, which were in the Library of Congress, and said, oh, this is interesting. And they sent, it went through a, a chain of people to uh, Urs Hartmanis, who is, uh, was one of my teachers, actually, at Cornell when I was an undergraduate. And he published a very short note saying this letter had been found. I thought, wow, that's really amazing. And so I asked him for a copy. That, that's uh, at least what I know about the, the discovery of it. Um, so this letter starts out, Lieber Herr von Neumann. I guess very formal. Maybe that's the way every, all German letters are start. I don't know. But uh, um, and he starts out in the, you know, ich habe mit 
I'm, I'm ter- my German is almost non-existent. Chag mit Grossen Gedanken von Ihre Erkrankung gehört, which is, he's talking about uh, von Neumann's illness. Uh, in fact, von Neumann was dying at that time. He died not that long after receiving this letter, I think. Um, I don't know if there's any connection. But... Uh, <laughs> um, and so he talks a little bit about uh, uh, he's you know hoping that these various treatments are going to uh, 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 help uh, von Neumann. Um, uh, and then he says, well, whatever, you know, let, let's turn to some mathematical questions. Um, and right. Uh, and so then he he raises. Um, he raises, goes, launches right into this question about brute force search. And what's so, I think, you know, you, maybe you haven't come far enough in the course uh, to appreciate this, but I think partly, partly also what's so amazing about this letter is just the terminology that he's using, which is very modern um, uh, in terms of measuring the number of steps you need, that an algorithm needs in terms of a Turing machine, for example. That was something that was only done in the lit- in the literature ten years later. Um, but okay, so he he concerns the, he considers the following problem. It's a mathematical question. He says, suppose you have a formal mathematical system. Well, let's not. I don't want to get into too many details about logic here. But you want to know if you have a, a mathematical statement. One of the one of the great accomplishments of mathematical logic was in formalizing what it means for. Uh, a mathematical theorem to have a proof. Okay, you know, m- proof is what mathematics is all about, you know, at least to mathematicians for the most part, I guess. Uh, you want to know, you, you know, that, that's the way you determine truth or falsity. We don't do experiments so much. You prove things, and that's proof is, you know, a sequence of logical arguments which can convince, uh, which, which makes a convincing case, convincing argument that a certain statement is true or false. Okay, so one of Gödel's great achievements was to show that there are certain mathematical statements which are true but don't have a proof, which went and was totally shocked the mathematical community of, of the, his day, which is in the 1930s uh, at the time, um, because you know great mathematicians like Hilbert believed that nothing would remain unknown in mathematics. Anything true had a proof, and would all you could all if you just looked hard enough, you'd find it. So um, Gödel showed that there are some things that are true but can't be proved, uh, and I can say more about that later if you're interested, because that in itself is a remarkable thing. But um, anyway, if you restrict your attention, um, okay. So another problem you haven't covered undecidability yet, but if you want to know, for a given s- s- mathematical statement, does it or does it not have a proof, you might imagine trying to answer that with a computer, but that's something that's beyond the power of computers to, to decide. That's an undecidable, unsolvable problem. So that's, a, you know, just does a, does a statement have a proof or not? That's another one of these undecidable problems. However, if you want to, if you restrict your attention to say, does a statement have a proof up to length a thousand, then it's certainly decidable. Because all you have to do is try all possible proofs. And you can check whether, you know, check whether a string constitutes a legal proof or not. That's part of what we mean by proof. You can always check to see whether it's a proof. So you can just try all possible strings, one after another, and see if any one of them is a proof of the, sta- of the statement. And since you only have to go up to length 1,000, you can certainly do it in finite time. However, that, as you can see, is one of these brute force type approaches. And what Gödel was asking von Neumann is whether you can solve the problem of testing whether uh, a statement has a proof up to length n more quickly than searching through all the, possi- all the, all the possible possibilities up to length n. I'm not, maybe I'm going to skip the technical way he puts it, um, but uh, he really he asks whether it can be. He says, conceivably, you can even, you know, phi of n is, is, the, is the time involved for the fastest machine to determine is there a proof of length n in general. Um, he says, maybe you can do that in 
time k times n for some k, which we would call linear time, or maybe you could do it for kn squared. Sort of almost getting at the idea of looking at different polynomials. Um, uh, so um, he says it's conceivable, and it would have tremendous implications for mathematics. I remember where he says that. Uh, uh, maybe it's down here. It says it would be very important for mathematics to decide what to, to decide whether or not you can solve uh, this problem um, without using brute force search. Now, how does he call brute force search? He calls it dem blossen probieren, blind probing. This was his term for brute, brute force search. And he goes on to talk about other problems besides testing if something has a proof. He talks about, for example, testing if, uh, prime, if something has a prime number or in general for finite combinatorial problems, whether or not you can el eliminate Blossen Probieren. Okay? They're right down here. Whether in, for, in, in Algamain, that's in general, whether even Blossen Probieren can be eliminated. Um, and then he goes on to talk about some other stuff, which is not that relevant to us. He mentions uh, this uh, posts problem, which is kind of a cool thing, uh, too, if you get further on in the subject. You know, you know there's problems which are decidable and there's problems which are undecidable. And so post-problem, there's a certain sense which you can ask, is there something which can be kind of in between? And that was an unsolved problem back in those days, in the 50s. And an 18-year-old named Richard Friedberg got the answer to the problem. And so he's writing, asking, did you hear about F Richard Friedberg's solution to this post problem? It's the same post that, you know, that's in the post-correspondence problem, which I mentioned in the book, by the way. Um, and, uh, and then he said, and unfortunately, uh, Friedberg's father insisted that he become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not going to go into mathematics. Uh, it's true. This is what happened to Friedberg. Uh, and then he signs it, you know, Kurt Gödel at the end. So I, I you know, I, I, I think this letter is really just an amazing discovery in the history of science um, about, uh, you know, thinking about that time among two great guys, at least, you know, at least Gödel, about this very fundamental problem. And subsequently, there was, you know, in recent years, there's a prize in theoretical computer science called the Gödel Prize. And the reason for naming it after Gödel was because of this letter. There's no record of Neumann ever no. or discussing this letter. No. No, right, no, unknown whether he thought about it or answered it or anything. Too bad, because presumably yeah. if he had thought about it, he might have gotten fairly far along the line. To sometimes take an idea well, von Neumann was a smart guy, but you know I have to say there's been other smart people since then, and uh, <laughs> um, we, well, we'll see. Let's see where does uh, uh, let's take us a little further into the present. Um, so this is a brief history of P and NP, and in general, sort of the complexity theory area. Um, so 1950s is Gödel's letter. Uh, in the 60s was really the birth of complexity theory through people, you know, uh, Michael Rabin, who's at Harvard, Manuel Blum, who was my advisor, Hart Manis, I mentioned. Various people uh, were set up the whole I, the field of measuring the number of steps that you need to solve a problem, how do you classify problems, just turning that into a mathematical discipline. Um, and... Uh, there's this notion of NP completeness. I don't know if this slide is a little bit small. Um, and the P versus NP question was basically in the early 70s by Cook and Levin and Karp. Uh, Levin was in the Soviet Union and Cook and Karp were here in the U.S. Uh, actually, well, Cook was maybe in Canada at that time. Yeah, so he was here in the America, in the, in the West, in the West. Is Levin at BU now? Yeah, Levin is at yeah. BU now. That's right. Um, so they basically formulated the P versus NP question as a uh, mathematical question. And uh, there was various attacks that were basically uh, didn't go anywhere in the early 70s uh, and, eight, you know, and up through the beginning of the 80s um, uh, on P versus NP. But what, what, there was not really much progress made on that problem. It's not even clear there's been much progress made on the problem at all. 
um, since it was proposed. But uh, one area where there has been a lot of progress is in terms of setting up a classification system in complexity theory for various computational problems. And just to give you some sense about what that looks like, um, you know, as I mentioned, there are these two classes, P and NP. Well, there are many other classes that have been investigated and proposed. Uh, so P and NP, hmm, my slide there red, but for some reason they came out black here. Is P and NP here uh, are uh, the two classes I mentioned. These are the, P is again the class of problems that you can solve quickly. NP are the problems which might involve searching. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other classes that have been investigated, both inside P and beyond NP. Um, and there's, there are many interesting questions that are not solved, in some cases, about the relationships among these classes. Um, but what is n very nice is that lots of, math lots of problems, computational problems, that people had been investigating turned out to, f to fit very nicely within this uh, classification system. Um, so like multiplication and addition, testing if there's a path from one point to another in a graph, computing the determinant, linear programming, uh, you probably saw that in the algorithms course. Those are all problems that can be solved, but within different levels of the complexity hierarchy inside, you know, quickly inside P. And then there are other problems which seem to go further out in difficulty. Um, so what I'd like to do, I hope it's not too ambitious, is to try to give you a little sense now of the kinds of things that people have tried to do to solve P and NP. Um, and, you know, by the way, you've been a very quiet, despite what I was promised, audience. Uh, um, so here is where it may get a little bit more technical. And don't let me lose you because I'm, not, I'm going to try not to say anything that can't be explained in a few words. Okay, so if you didn't get it through, it's my fault. Feel free to jump in. Um, okay, so when investigating problems like P and NP and trying to determine how much computation you need to solve a problem. One of the things that's nice to do is to work with the simplest computational model that you can come up with. Because, you know, you could try to develop your mathematical theory about, you know, your Sun Spark Station or whatever the current thing is, your Linux box, or you could try to work with something simpler like a Turing machine um, because it's adv advantageous to try to set up things, you know, your, your basic underlying um, formalism as crisply and as simply as possible in order to be able to prove something about it. So here, the, I'm going to propose to you the, the, the model of computation that m people in my area generally think about. And that's called the Boolean circuit. And if you've ever run in, done any hardware design, you've seen these things already. Because all that I have in mind here in red are variables which can take on the values 0 and 1, or true and false if you want, wires in green here that can carry the uh, truth value, you know, the, the, the assignment to the variable, up to one of these blue, uh, blue uh, objects. And those are like mini, well, those are called gates. Those, those compute very simple things. So maybe this is all uh, stuff that you've seen already. So this is a, an AND gate that computes the AND of the things coming in and spits out the, that value. And this is an OR gate that computes the OR of things coming in and spits out that value. And so, and here's a negation. Um, and uh, so what we have here is a representation for a certain computation, a certain kind of a function. You put in values into the variables, those five variables here. You, uh, you propagate up through the circuit, and you get a value here up the top, which is the output. 
Okay. Is that? Because I'm going to spend the next like 10 minutes talking about circuits. So if you didn't, might as well at least learn what a circuit is. You know, if, you, if you didn't see it before. Okay. So, um, good. Um, so now what's going to be important to us are measuring the, um, uh, uh, measuring certain parameters of the circuit. For example, the, you know, counting how many gates does the circuit have, or how many, uh, how many levels does the circuit need to, to do a certain computation. Things like that. That's what's going to be uh, important when we're considering the complexity of a function. Um, so in particular, what I'm going to be interested in, for certain functions that I may want to compute down here, how many gates do I need? Because it's going to turn out that the number of gates you need to compute your function is closely related to the amount of time you need to compute your function on a more standard model of compu uh, uh, computer. Those two things are very much tied to each other. Seems a little bit perhaps unintuitive that gates on the one hand should correspond to time, um, but maybe it would help you a little bit just to realize that for the particular kinds of circuits I'm considering, you're not allowed to have loops. So all you know, uh, information has to propagate through the circuit. And so in a sense, you can imagine the more gates you need, sort of the more time for propagation you're going to need. You might, maybe you might think about it's closely, more closely related to the depth. In a certain sense, that's true. But don't, let, let, let's look at it with fuzzy glasses for now. OK? So the, um, the size of the circuit is going to correspond, roughly speaking, to the amount of time. It's going to be close enough for my purposes. Um, okay. So let me here restate what I just said. There is a close relation with time complexity um, for the uh, no, circuit complexity, namely the number of gates that you need is closely related to the amount of time you need. And there's a theorem that says for any function f that's being computed, you can compute it in a certain number of steps, let's say a Turing machine, if you can compute it in that number of steps, then it has circuits with that number of steps times the logarithmic factor gates. Okay? So flipping that around, if you want to prove that a function is not in P, so that a function cannot be computed with a polynomial number of steps. That means that you have to show that it requires more than a polynomial number of gates. Okay. So, yeah. Computable in T n steps uh, in, a, in a linear fashion. I mean, the way you had before it had a bunch of gates operating in parallel, but. Okay, so I'm, maybe I'm being a little bit too um, short-winded in my slide. Computable in TN steps on a Turing machine. So I'm, I'm mixing two different models now. I'm comparing time on a Turing machine with number of gates in a circuit. So a Turing machine is supposed to be our proxy for like a, a workstation. So computable in TN steps, if you want to think about it as, you know, on your favorite com com uh, computer model, if you can do it in that number of steps, then you can compute it in a circuit with slightly more gates than that number of steps. So, if, got that? So you just have to add in this extra logarithmic factor. You know, for our purposes, ignore that. So if you can do that with some number of steps, you can compute it with that number of gates, roughly speaking. So f you can flip that around because really our whole hope in trying to solve the P and NP question, at least you know 99% of researchers in the field believe P is different from NP. And so what it, that would amount to is taking a problem like factoring and proving that it's not solvable without brute force. 
So therefore, it's not in P. And that would mean that any procedure would re need more than a polynomial amount of time to solve it. That's what you want to do. Trying to show that your problem needs more than a polynomial amount of time. And by virtue of this theorem, it would be enough to show that it needs more than a polynomial number of gates. Okay, I'm, I'm not losing you here. Um, because the whole direction of the field, at least for the past you know, um, 20 years, has been to try to understand how to prove circuits need lots of gates. So that's what I want to say a little bit about. Because there's, you know, basically, it's mostly kind of, um, uh, it's kind of bad news that I have to report. Um, let me see. Uh, bad news is that we don't know how to prove circuits need lots of gates. Because if we did, we would have solved the P and NP question. And in fact, the state of knowledge for proving circuits needs lots of gates is extremely weak. Um, we know how to prove there are functions that have N inputs. In order to solve the P and NP question, well, there are functions which have N inputs where we can prove you need like five N gates. We don't even know how to prove something needs 100 N gates. But to solve P and NP, you'd have to prove that the circuit needs more than N squared gates or N cubed gates for any polynomial. You know, N to the, N to the, N to the million. You have to prove it needs more than N to any power number of gates, whereas the state of the art is to prove that it only needs five, ga five N gates. So we're way off from what we need to be able to do. Um, but what, ha what have we been doing with all, uh, all this time? So what people have been doing is um, looking at circuits which have been restricted in certain ways. It's kind of li like this. Just, you know, uh, going back to workstations as your computational model. You want to prove your workstation needs lots of time to solve the problem. Don't know how to do that. So let's do something like uh, pull out a bunch of the wires. Not enough so that it completely breaks, but so that it has to limp along, you know, doing its computing. So now with this sort of wounded machine, hopefully you have more techniques available to prove that it needs more time. It's like you tie one hand behind its back. Now it has to, you know, compute, you know, just uh, with a lim much more limited set of capabilities. And when you do that, people have had m more success in proving that uh, um, the circuits in this case need to be large. And that's the way mathematicians often work: is that they can't, they have a very big problem that they're trying to solve, they can't uh, do it. They try to look at, you know, some smaller cases, some simpler versions of that problem, where hopefully they can solve it in the simpler case, and in so doing, hopefully learn something, which might be more useful generally. Um, okay, so the two cases I'm, I alluded to here are the so-called monotone circuits. Let me just say what those are. Um, and uh, the bounded depth circuits. So in the case of monotone circuits, you, you look at what, the, what is the power of the circuit when you eliminate negations. Suppose these circuits have ands and ors only. They can still compute lots of interesting things. But for such circuits, it has been shown that uh, the circuits need to be very big to solve uh, problems that, you know, the, the problems that we're looking at. Okay, so the negations somehow seem to be key. What's very big? Uh, exponentially large, more than polynomial. So that's what you need. You need the, you know, the the goal here is to prove the circuits on and n inputs have more than polynomial, or hopefully even exponential in n size, to solve, 
you know, these searching problems. If you do that, you're golden. But that theorem you had before doesn't. Now that the whole the theorem, the, it, uh, you know, the good news is that we can say something here. The bad news is no longer any connection with uh, ordinary uh, Turing machine or, or standard uh, c computing time. So, you know, this is a very nice theorem, and the guy who solved it got a big prize for doing it. But um, it didn't really tell us what we want to know about P and NP. But you know, maybe we learned something along the way. Uh, obviously, not enough, but uh, <laughs> um, still, it's progress. Um, so let me not get too much. I was going to have some more slides on the details of how we did that, which I can have to talk about later, uh, if anybody's interested. Um, let me talk a little bit about bounded depth circuits, which is something actually I personally worked in. Um, so these are circuits where you limit um, the number of levels. And perhaps for circuits with a limited number of levels, as a kind of a handicap, a kind of you know tying this hand behind the back of the circuit, you have a better chance of proving the circuit needs to be big. And that was successfully carried out. Um, and in, in this case, I can I'll be a little bit more concrete about the theorem that we showed. Um, if you take the, here, here's a concrete result that we proved. If you consider the function which just counts the number of ones among the input and tells you whether it's even or odd, that's the so-called parity function. And you want to make a circuit which computes that function. Well, if you allow yourself logarithmic depth, it's not too hard to come up with a pretty small circuit. And in fact, that's the circuit that you would probably come up with if you played around with it on your own a little bit to compute the power. You would sort of make a, a tree of like exclusive OR gates, which you could then implement with ANS and ORs if you wanted. And they would all sort of fan together, and the whole size would be linear. It would be some constant times n, and the depth would be logarithmic. Now, but suppose for the reasons of trying to learn something about circuit complexity, you restricted your depth say, all the, way, all the way down to depth 2. So the circuit would, in that case, look like just an and of ors of variables or negated variables. In that case, it's easy to prove that the circuit needs to be exponentially big. I'm not going to do that right here. But you can show that for depth 2 circuits, exponential size is necessary. And the question that me and a few other people looked at was what happens in an intermediate case. Suppose you consider depth 3 or depth 12. Is it conceivable then there, you could solve it with a polynomial number of gates, or maybe the circuit still needed to be very big. And the theorem that we proved was that for any depth d, the parity circuits need more than polynomial size. And there was a number of interesting ideas that came out to there, and we probably don't really have time to talk about it here, which I think possibly could say something about applications to problems like PNNP. Um, anyway, this. Ah, no. Now, it's a D is constant. Good question. D is constant in order to get this theorem. Now, as you allow D to be growing, like log log n, say, then, well, there's still going to be, there are actually very precise bounds known now. Um, but it's still more than polynomial, but, uh, you know, if so for a constant depth D, you actually show it's. Ex it's exponential, and the exponent itself varies depending upon exactly which d you select. If you have log log n for d, so it's slowly growing, it, it drops down below exponential, but it's still more than polynomial. It's kind of in an intermediate zone. And if d gets all the way up to log n over log log n, so that's very near to log n, but not quite there, it's up above linear, but still within polynomial. So there's a kind of a trade-off. As you allow more depth, the size can shrink. And that's all been pretty well worked out. Um, all right, I, I don't know. I um, Maybe just one more slide. See, you know, one thing that's key, you know, one, one thing that came out of this is a very deep understanding 
of these very shallow circuits, low depth circuits. And this has some connection with, I don't have, I'm skipping over this bottom slide here, but there are some connections with even infinitary objects, so in, so-called infinite parity functions and infinite parity circuits, uh, which may have countable or uncountable, if you don't know how much, you know, mathematical logic you've seen, but there's, there's um, some nice connections with other branches of mathematics that have come out of that. And I think the thing that's made me a little hopeful that this might have some bearing on PNNP. It hasn't born, b been borne out yet, but I've not totally given up, ho given up hope on it. Um, it's conceivable. Is that you can express all searching problems in terms of depth <coughs> two circuits, which have so-called non-deterministic bits. Okay, so um, I'm hoping that something we've learned about depth two, the shallow, low depth circuits may shed some light on this class NP. All right. So th anyway, that's all I want to say about P and NP. What I thought I'd do is since I, let me branch out a little bit more broadly into in complexity theory, um, tell you a little bit about what's been going on more recently because my history slide stopped in the 80s. Um, so. In the 1990s, I think for the most part, people moved away from the P and NP question as an active area of research. Basically, people, most people didn't have a good idea of how to tackle, tackle that problem. And complexity theory uh, continued to be very fertile during that period, but in other directions. And I'd just like to say a little bit about what people had been doing. So I think... So you might as well. Better? Yeah. Good. Didn't miss, you. Didn't miss me anyway. I have a loud voice. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so I think you know, sort of, uh, what I, the way I would sort of characterize work in the 1990s has been on exotic computational models. What do I mean by that? Uh, so there's one kind of a model. Um, called an interactive proof system that was proposed um, about 10 years ago um, and which has had a tremendous imp impact on the field. Well, if you haven't really dealt to, I don't know how much you've seen of NP, if you have a good understanding of NP, you feel. Um, so then hope maybe I can make some, um, have you seen interactive proof systems? Yeah, no, yeah. that, okay. Let me try to give you a, a little flavor of what that is. Um, because, you know, in the case of NP, Say, if you take a problem in NP like factoring, in a sense, or satisfiability maybe is a better example. If I want to prove to you that a formula is satisfiable, I just have to show you the satisfying assignment. If I want to prove to you the formula is not satisfiable, looks like I'm out of luck because I would have to walk through all possible assignments and show you that none of them work. So that's the essence of NP is that m Membership is has an, is easy to verify. Um, but this idea of an interactive proof system, in a certain sense, uh, shows that that intuition or that feeling is not exactly right. And let me give you an example. I'll, 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 let me illustrate that. Um, there's a very nice ex problem that people have worked on for a long time. No, another one. This field is full of problems that people have worked on for a long time without success. Uh, called the graph isomorphism problem. Graph isomorphism problem is you're given two graphs. You know, just points and lines. Two graphs. And I want to know, are they really the same graph that have been relabeled. What? We talked about it this morning. Talk about it this morning. Great. Um, so, presented as a kind of a language, the way we do it in in complexity theory, you know, if I uh, give you the two graphs, I mean, so the isomorphism problem is an NP problem. 
because you can prove to me that the two graphs are isomorphic just by exhibiting which nodes match up with which nodes. Then I can see that the edge, edges go along correctly. You with me? So by just you have to just give me the mapping. The isomorphism is what you tell me, and then I can check that it works. So the isomorphism problem is in NP. Whether it's in P, whether you can test whether two graphs are isomorphic quickly, not known. How about to prove that two graphs are not isomorphic? Well, that's not known to be in, in NP, and itself would be a very big result if you could prove, show that that was in NP. The non-isomorphism problem. Can you write down a short proof? Um, here's, the, here's the setup. You think of there being, in, in an interactive proof system, there are two parties. There's a prover. So you guys, the prover is sort of thought of as being unlimited computationally. So it's like a, a king with an army of slaves or graduate students, <laughs> undergraduate, whatever. Um, and um, the king is, you know, limited in comp that two graphs are not. There's no way of matching of re, you know, re, uh, of uh, uh, permuting one so that they lay one on top of another and are the same. How do you prove that they really are different? Nobody knows. But nonetheless, there is a certain sense in which if you allow us to have a dialogue back and forth, I can convince you that two graphs really are not isomorphic if in fact they aren't. Quickly. So you have to understand, here is the rules of the game. Um, let's flip it around. You're going to convince me. So the, 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 in this setup, how am I, how am I doing time-wise? Fine, okay. Because we're going to, this is my last slide. No ability. But by virtue of there being so many people in the army, they are essentially unlimited. And now imagine this king who has two graphs and he wants to know, are they or are they not isomorphic? Now, it's not enough for the king just to hand the problem to his slaves or her slaves and say, you know, what's the answer and be and you know, here, well, isomorphic and go home happy because the king knows the slaves are inherently lazy and the king not only wants to know the answer but it wants to be convinced of the answer. He wants to be sure that they really did the work and they found out the right answer. So if the graphs really are isomorphic, we're in good shape. Because the slaves have a way of convincing the king that they're isomorphic. How do they do that? They show how it matches up. They're, you know, they, you know, they have billions and billions of slaves. They can work, and they have to, you know, slave over this and work it out. But they can eventually find the way it matches up, if in fact it does. And they just show the king how it matches up, and the king is convinced. But suppose they don't match up. Suppose the graphs are not isomorphic. What are the slaves going to do? Because it's not an NP, as far as we know. We don't know it's an NP. But there still is something they can do. And, they, and it works like this. It's really cool. Um, what the, they're going to engage in the following protocol. The king is going to take the two graphs, let's call them A and B. He's going to turn his back and flip a coin secretly to pick one or the other at random. Say, so picked A. Okay? Then he's going to further flip some more coins to randomly rearrange A into a new graph, C. Okay? And then he sends C over to the slaves and says and asks, did C come from A or did it come from B? Now think about that. If the, sla the, sl the slaves can determine that through a lot of work, and if they can answer that question reliably, so the king maybe does this thing a hundred times, if they can answer that question reliably, it must have been the case that the two graphs were not isomorphic. Because if they had been, if A and B really were isomorphic, then C could have come from either one. And the slaves would have no way of knowing which was the source of C. 
But if the graphs are not isomorphic, then you can I tell because the slaves just have to go through the process of determining whether the C is isomorphic to A or whether it's isomorphic to B, and then they know which one it came from. So they do this over and over again, and if they always get the right answer, the king is pretty convinced, either that or the slaves are incredibly lucky, um, but the king is pretty convinced that the two graphs had to be not isomorphic. So this is a way of sort of generalizing the idea of NP to allow for this interaction and this randomness um, with a slow, small probability of error, but still, you know, kind of remarkably allows you to prove things uh, have a certain property even though they're sort of not in NP. Um, so that's one exotic model. The other exotic model is something you may have heard something about. I'm not going to say too much about it. It's uh, uh, called a quantum computer. Uh, and a quantum computer is something that uh, exists in theory, but maybe someday is actually something we might be able to build. Um, it apparently doesn't violate any laws of physics. And it says that if you could somehow store your bits down on the spin of electrons, you know, something really at a very, very much more microscopic level than we're even doing today, conceivably you can use quantum effects to somehow put your computer into a combination of all sorts of different states simultaneously. And in so doing, have the computer sort of search through all of the many possibilities in brute force, through a brute force search, without having to try them at one after another. It just sort of does them in parallel within the one physical device, just by the magic of quantum mechanics. And so one of the resu results that was shown not that long ago, also the guy who got that also got a prize, um, Peter Shor, that, uh, for, for example, if you could really build a quantum computer, then you could factor numbers in polynomial time, even though we know to, don't know how to do that in, on a regular computer. Um, so uh, let me just close with um, uh, getting back to P and NP. I remember I gave this talk a few years back at Cornell, and Hart Manis was there, uh, the guy who gave me the girl's letter in the first place and was my teacher as an undergraduate. Um, he asked a question after my talk, which was not that different from this talk. He, answered, he just said, when? <laughs> which I think he meant was, when is it going to be solved? And uh, I had a bet that I made with Len Adelman as an undergraduate, as a graduate student, excuse me, we were graduate students together at Berkeley in the 70s, and we bet, I bet that it would be solved by the end of the century, and he bet that it would not be solved. Well, I paid up my ounce of gold, which was the value of the bet this last year. So I don't know, it's hard to predict when this problem is going to get solved. Uh, I still am, you know, uh, kind of uh, hopeful, but um, I, hard to say. Anyway. That's my talk. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. No question. Could you explain yes. a bit more what you mean uh, by an interactive proof system? Is this something that you actually model physically? Or no. Just a, just in, a, an interactive proof system is not intended to be modeled physically. Just kind of like NP really doesn't have exactly a physical counterpart. I mean, not in... Uh, what I mean is computationally. Can you well, I mean, there are many variants to interactive proof systems. Um, the, sort of the, the garden variety, the most simplest one, is the one I was kind of referring to, where there's a verifier and a prover. The verifier is considered to be polynomial time limited. Sort of that's a, a real computer. But the prover is kind of considered to be unlimited computationally. And that's the unrealistic. Uh, and so that doesn't really have a physical counterpart. However, there are other variants that are concerned more in the cryptography area, where the prover is not considered to be un computationally unlimited. It's just considered to be something that has special information, like a password. Um, and then you want the prover to be able to convince the verifier that he has the password, say, which which sounds pretty trivial because the 
could prove we can just say, well, the password is, you know, um, pizza, and uh, that's the, the password has been, then the verifier is convinced. But it gets a little bit more subtle when you want the prover to convince the verifier that he knows the password without saying what the password is or even revealing any information about the password so that you can then you subsequently use the password multiple times. And there are ways of doing that. So there is a pretty big theory, especially in the cryptography area, where this thing does correspond to real buildable things. But in the complexity theory side, not so much. Are they randomized, like the example? You yes, I think the prover and the verifier. Yeah, the, generally the interactive proof systems are randomized protocols. That's right. What else? Yeah. In, in the example of slice of kings, did the slice have any information about how many random tosses the king did? And how fast they worked? Yeah, they, yeah, you can assume that the slaves know how many randomized, uh, how much random information the king has access to. Yeah, you can assume that. Um, uh, right. But I'm not sure that that's going to help them, at least in this case. In other cases, it might. Um, they still have to do isomorphism testing themselves, and the only way to do that, if you want to consider them to be physical devices, would be through a brute force approach. It, it, it would seem to me that they could cut down, they're lazy by nature. That's right. They could cut down their work if they knew that it was within 100 tosses that the team was able to manipulate one of the original two graphs. I see what you're saying. So if he didn't, he didn't uh, move it too far from the original, uh, in a sense. Interesting idea. I don't know whether that might corrupt the protocol, though. If he was too, he was too, um, you know, uh, conservative about the amount of randomness he's using to move the thing around, the protocol may not work anymore. It may not be a convincing protocol to the king. Um, yeah. With the interactive uh, questioning technique, it seems to me that. Both uh, using the interactive questioning or without it, you're still only getting uh, a statistical uh, chance of being right on yep. your answer. I mean, that's true. If you if you just send the slaves out to verify and they come back, you know, two millennium later, sorry yep. we didn't find anything. You've still only got a statistical probability that they don't match. No, that's not the way it works, though. You don't say, they don't come back and say, we didn't find anything, because they could be, that's not convincing to the king. They could be lazy. They could have been playing, doing that, that, that was two millennia, and, and, you know, and playing, you know, playing Go or something. Useless. But, uh, <laughs> um, they could have been just wasting their time. Okay, I, I, you know, and then they say, well, we worked hard, we couldn't find anything, but maybe there was something easy to find that they just didn't report. But the, the protocol, if you think about the protocol I described, they're actually having to work hard and they convince the king in the end. The only way they can be getting the answer that they were getting would be for the graphs really to be not isomorphic, unless they were extremely unlikely, uh, un, un, unless they were extremely lucky. Right, but your clock cycles don't suddenly stop. Your your machine, your computer, yep. doesn't get lazy. It runs on at a certain clock cycle. So I, yep. I, I, I'm not sure what the, where the laziness comes in. Okay. All right. Um, the the question is really, I mean, certainly, the um, uh, are you are you saying that you're not sure that the clock cycles are well spent? Would that be no. a correlation? You no. Know, it's see, it's not. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of the clearest way to answer your question. I think the 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 thing to the idea here is a little bit analogous to NP. I mean, if you're just going to restrict your attention to only buildable things, even the notion of NP is irrelevant. I mean, you, there are some problems that take a long time to solve, some problems take a short time to solve. But the magic of NP is that there are some problems where it's easy. Even they may take a long time to solve, they're short to verify. And that's what this is similar. I mean, the non-isomorphism, it's short to verify in a somewhat different sense. You can verify nine, nine I mean, if you want to, 
you, you know, if you don't, say you don't completely trust your computer, maybe it's, you know, it has to be running for a, a long, long time. Maybe it flipped a few bits along the way. So it's just the fact that the computer gives you an answer, maybe not something totally that you can trust. Um, but if you engage in this pro protocol, all the computing that you need to do, you can do yourself. So it's completely convincing, even beyond the faith that you would have to put into the computer that, that it's actually getting the right answer. So that's not a great answer to the question. It's really, I think in the end, it's ultimately kind of a mathematical characterization that's interesting here. Um, and maybe the, I'm, I'm not coming up with the best motivation in terms of, you know, practicality that I, that I could, but let me think about that. I yeah. guess uh, non, non deterministically, you can do the interactive one yep. in, in constant or linear time, depending on how many verifications you want, whereas the other one, uh, even non deterministically, well, I'm not sure, non deterministically. Well, doing what? Doing what non determinist? I mean, if you want to non deterministically check that graphs are not isomorphic, that doesn't really help you beyond ordinary deterministic computation, as far as we know. So you're going to have to still non-deterministically go through lots of different possibilities. Non-determinism helps you when you're oring things and not when you're anding things. Okay. So it's just from non-isomorphism, you have to check all these possibilities. Right. Each one of them has to. Yeah. Just one of them. What is that machine on the cover of your book? Good question. Uh, you know, I didn't pick that. Book. I didn't pick that cover. My publisher picked that cover, though. I, I think it's a very nice cover, actually. Uh, and I, um, you know, it is by uh, you know, it's by um, Da Vinci. Uh, this picture, and it's a. It's some, it's, I mean, I looked it up. It's a, uh, it's a kind of a screw. Um, you, ha you have to, if you look carefully, you can figure out what it's can doing. Oh. <laughs> can you focus on it? Um, Millions of people over the internet now. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, What's the list price? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the uh, I can't know. I'm trying to remember exactly. The, 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 oh, you want to turn. You want to. I can't remember. There's something about maintaining a constant uh, um, force on this screw, but I can't remember. So you're trying to change rotational this way to, I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. I have to think about that. Um, uh, but, you know, if you look, you can actually sort of figure out what it's doing. If you look, you'll see there's, there's, there are two sets of, there's a set of teeth and a set of um, uh, gear that the teeth are fitting into. And as this thing is get, being raised, um, the teeth go further in, so they're not turning as fast, and they're the and the gear is getting larger that they're fitting into. So somehow there's something that's balancing out there. I can't I can't remember now what the reason for doing that is, but it's uh, um, there is a reason there that's not that hard to figure out. I just not I just not remembering it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what would girl having demonstrated that interest, can you give us any intuitive thing on how, you know, the whole notion of completeness and incompleteness in this NP stuff ties together? Uh, do they? Um, well, it, let's see. You know, Girdle was, I think, interested for whatever reason in whether mathematics or the work of a mathematician could be automated. And 
he showed that the problem of testing and on the you know, the problem of testing whether something has a proof or not is undecidable, un- uns- unsolvable by computer. Um, and but if it was possible, and it is decidable if you limit the number of limit the length. Um, now, if it, if it turned out that that was solvable quickly, then in fact mathematics could be automated. But if it took a long time then you sort of back to where we were in the first place. It's, it's, now it's, it's solvable, but not in practice. On the one hand, it's unsolvable. In the other case, it's solvable, but not in practice. So it still remains sort of beyond, um, uh, beyond what you can do. I remember, um, uh, I remember as a kid, there was this, these, you, I don't know if you've seen any of these. It was a series by Ta- Time Life. You're all too young for this. But the Time Life had a series of books on different subjects, and they had one in mathematics, which was fantastic. If you can get a hold of that, it's the old thing now. It's like 40 years old or so. Um, and I remember they had a picture of Girdle in there. He was a kind of a strange-looking guy. And uh, he, the caption was, um, he's trying to d- determine if the human mind is a computer. So presumably, the guy who wrote the book must have gotten that somehow from Gödel, I, I guess. And so that maybe gives a little bit of, of a clue as to how this is fitting together, at least philosophically speaking. Mathematically, they're actually pretty different. What are you doing right now? What am I doing right now? I'm on leave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what am I doing? I'm actually... thats I don't mean to be flip. I'm actually... I've gone back and forth working on PNNP and giving it a rest um, and you know writing a book and various things. Um, I'm actually lately have been seeing if I my last rest has been enough to get any new ideas, which so far hasn't. But so I'm actually been thinking about circuit complexity and such things for the past few months. No, no news yet. <laughs> Question? I think this morning when we were talking about graph isomorphism, we were discussing whether you could check whether two regular sets were identical. Yep. And uh, someone suggested we just minimize the two finite state machines and then right. check whether they were the same. Yes. So I challenged that person right. to say how they would do that. Yes. And I, we talked about that theoretically that would be hard until someone explained it. Right. Could, kind of do it because the edges are labeled. Exactly. The, you can use the labeling to help you out. But the general problem of testing whether two graphs are isomorphic, well, um, that would be great if you could solve one of that, solve that. It's also, it's like PNNP, it's attracted a lot of people. So, but that's not, no, is that known to be NP-complete? No, uh, not known to be NP-complete. It's one of the few problems that are sort of, NP, the problems that are NP-complete, if you solve any one of those quickly, you solve all of NP quickly. Um, so those are sort of more hopeless in a sense. Um, but something like graph isomorphism is kind of in between, seems to be anyway. Not known to be NP complete, but not known to be NP. But it wouldn't have such huge consequences if it went into P, so it's more plausible that it would. Um, so go work on it tonight. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Very thank much. you.